Brother Moore is going to be discussing atonement. And this will be particularly the atonement of Israel and how that differs from the atonement for the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Here's Brother Moore. Thank you, and I welcome you to Grace Believers Bible Study again this morning. Will you turn in your Bible with me to Leviticus chapter 23? Leviticus 23, we'll be talking about the atonement. And I thank you for watching. And as usual, I'd like to recommend that you get a Bible and study the Scripture with us. If you cannot do that, if you have no access to a Bible, then I recommend that you write down the Scriptures, the references, and study them for yourself to see whether these things are true. Now, what we're doing, we're trying to compare the church, which is the body of Christ, and the time that we now live in, the dispensation of the grace of God, we're trying to compare that, and uh, especially in the day of atonement, the time of atonement. So you need to write down the scripture references and compare them. The Bible says the way to study, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, by comparing spiritual things with spiritual Jesus Christ in John chapter 6 said, <clears throat> The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they're life. Now I know then that I've got a book that is God breathed. Breathing. And so God spoke these words to someone as they wrote. So these words are God-inspired. They're God-breathed. So spiritual things are words in the book. The words are descriptive in many cases. They describe things. So if you're going to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to have to see what the Bible says. Because the Spirit of God wrote the book. So comparing spiritual things with spiritual things is comparing one verse with another. So that's exactly what we want to do. Now, before we read, I want to mention something to you. We've discussed in the past, along this same line, about the ministry of Jesus Christ. And if we start back here and we say, right here begins the ministry of John the Baptist, which people call the forerunner to Jesus Christ. Now, John the Baptist came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But not only that, in Mark chapter 1, the Bible said that he preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. So his ministry looked forward to a kingdom, but he looked forward to the king that would reign in that kingdom. Then comes Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ preached, as in Matthew chapter 3, the gospel of the kingdom. That is the good news of the establishment of of the kingdom that had been prophesied in the Old Testament Scriptures. David is the king, the throne is in Jerusalem, and so he's preaching the coming of that kingdom. Now, the children of Israel did not receive him. They didn't believe him. Uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But instead, they said away with this man. They said, we will not have this man to reign over us. They said... Caesar is our king, so they demanded that Jesus Christ be crucified. So they rejected the king, crucified him, and so Jesus Christ had taught the apostles what ministry to carry on after he had been crucified, risen, and ascended up. So he is as a king gone on exile. He died on Calvary for your sins, was buried, rose again, 
And then he ascended up to heaven, and they watched him go. And they watched the clouds receive him out of their sight as he went up. So Jesus Christ then ascended up to heaven and sent down the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching something called the gospel of the circumcision. Uh, he is uh, preaching more or less the same message that was preached back here. He's just doing it in a little bit different manner. Uh, in other words, he's preaching, you crucified the Messiah, you crucified the King of Israel, you put to death your King, but God has raised him up. And he's going to come back again and establish his kingdom. And when they heard that they had crucified their Messiah, when they understood that the one that had been crucified is the son of God, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Isaac, the son of David, the heir to the throne, they were pricked in their heart. And according to Acts 2, they said unto the apostles and so forth, they said, men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. Now, the verse is very controversial in the eyes of people that don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. There is constant harassment about it, hassling over it. Some say that the word for in the verse means repent and be baptized in order to get remission of sins. Some say, repent and be baptized because you've already got remission of sins, and on and on and on. You see, there are those that want to take Acts chapter 2 and apply the word for to the dispensation of the grace of God. There are those that are in this dispensation out here that look at the verse in its reality by comparing spiritual things with spiritual, comparing the verse with chapter 3, verse 19. They compare the verse, we compare the verse with Acts 3.19. In Acts 3.19, Peter said, preaching to Israel, Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when times of oppression shall come from the presence of the Lord. In other words, the Lord then is going to return. The Lord is going to come back and he's going to establish his kingdom someday. And so Peter is saying, Repent and be identified with the Messiah by what a baptism, in order that you may get remission of sins when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send him, the deliverer shall roar out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So Peter says, Repent and be baptized for remission of sins. So the Lord is going to come again. When he comes again, all Israel shall be saved in the day of atonement. Now the word atonement means at one -ment. Israel is separated from his people Israel today. They rejected him. They put a separation between themselves and the Lord. But during the tribulation period before the second coming, they're going to get their act together. And they're going to call upon the Lord. They're going to want him to return. And they're going to repent and turn to the Lord, and he's going to come back and cleanse them from all iniquity, and all Israel will be saved in that day. Now, look in Leviticus 23. And by the way, in Leviticus 23, the feast days of the Lord are referred to. In fact, look in verse 4. Leviticus 23, 4, these are the feast days of the Lord, and he begins to lay them out. Verse 5, in the fourteenth day of the first month that is the Lord's path, or, past, all right, Jesus Christ was crucified on the fourteenth day of the first month. So the, the verse in Leviticus 23, verse 5, 
looks forward then to the day that Jesus Christ would be crucified, the Passover lamb. Uh, verse 16, on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread, and on and on and on. So, so the, the feast days are laid out. In fact, they include, look in verse 15, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheath of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days. And you shall offer a meat offering, uh, a new meat offering of the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves. And the loaves represent Israel. They represent them as the nation, the people of God, and the two wave loaves represent the separation of the ten tribes with the with the two tribes today. So this feast day back here in Leviticus represents Pentecost over here. Fifty days. Five. Pente. Pentecost. Well, Pentecost is a feast day observed by Israel. It has nothing to do with the church, which is the body of Christ. It had to do with a church called a nation, the formation of a new nation of Israel, a formation of a new na nation of priests, but it has nothing to do with the body of Christ. The body of Christ had to do with a mystery. This is no mystery that is a fulfillment of prophecy. So the day of Pentecost, Peter preached unto them a murder indictment and said, You crucified the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is a fulfillment of Pentecost or the 50-day feast that is referred to in the context. Now, come on to verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. And you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this Sabbath month, there shall be a day of atonement. So the atonement for Israel is in the seventh month, tenth day of the month. Now, notice some things about this atonement this particular day. Turn, please, to Zechariah. I look in Zechariah chapter 12 and 13. Zechariah chapter 12. In Zechariah 12, the context is the second coming of Christ. It's that day when He's going to come again. Remember that Jesus Christ fulfilled a lot of offices. And one has to do with the priest himself. The priest offered the blood of a bullock for the people on the Day of Atonement. Well, Jesus Christ is not only the priest, but he's the bullock himself. He's the bullock that was slain, whose blood was caught in a basin, and that blood sprinkled behind the veil on the mercy seat for atonement. So Jesus Christ, the high priest then, as it were, spiritually takes his blood and goes behind the veil as the great high priest. And so there he is today, hid behind the veil. No one can see him. He's behind there doing the work or having done the work that needed to be done. 
But someday, just as the high priest in Leviticus chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 25 and so forth, that high priest came forth from offering that sacrifice. So it is Jesus Christ, the great high priest, that's going to come forth on the Day of Atonement. Now, back in the passage, in Zechariah, look in <clears throat> verse 9, Zechariah 12, 9, It shall come to pass in that day that I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Uh, this is like uh, Revelation chapter 19, uh, Armageddon and so forth. So the Lord's going to come down. Verse 10, I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they pierced. And he goes on and on and on. Now, chapter 13, in that day, the coming of the Lord, in that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. In other words, then, the fountain from back here, the fountain of blood, will be opened unto them over here. They don't have access to that blood right now. It is over there. And so in Acts chapter 2, they said, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized for remission of sins. Repent and be identified with the Messiah in water baptism for or unto, looking unto, the fountain being opened unto you that they knew was in the verse. They knew uh, uh, Zechariah 13 verse 1 was in the Scriptures. So in Acts 3 verse 19 he said, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of repression shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. There isn't any doubt about it. The preaching of Peter back here pertaining to salvation looks forward to salvation at the second coming of Christ. Not in, not in this age in which we live. Peter did not know that there was a great parenthesis in here. He didn't know that there'd be a period of time in here called the dispensation of the grace of God. He knew absolutely nothing about it. He believed that the Antichrist would come immediately after this period of time and that they'd go through the tribulation and then the Lord would return. He just preached what he knew. The Lord had not revealed this in here unto him. That was reserved for the Apostle Paul. Now, notice in uh, Romans, look in Romans 11. In Romans 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? The context is Israel as a nation. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So the fall of Israel came then. Israel did not all repent and, and were not exalted as they will be over here and lead the nations. Instead, it's a constant fall. It's a constant downhill. It's a fall. It's a diminishing and a casting away. So in A.D. 70, they were cast away, cast out of the land, and carried among the nations. So during this period of time in here, Israel is not known as the people of God today. They're low am I, not God's people. Check it out. In Hosea, chapter 1 through 3. Hosea, chapter 1 through 3. Read about it. So Israel is low am I. They're not the nation of God's people today. They are fallen. And through their fall, 
salvation came to the Gentiles. Now, notice in verse 25, Romans 11, 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, over here, and turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. When will God take away Israel's sins? When the deliverer rolls out of Zion. What is going to take place? The fountain of blood is going to be opened unto Israel for sin and uncleanliness, as in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. They all match together. So the day of atonement for Israel is over here. Well, what is that day of atonement going to be to them? Look in Romans chapter 4. Take Romans chapter 4 and take Psalm 82. I'm sorry, Psalm, let's see, just a minute, 35, I believe I want. No. Psalm 32. Take Psalm 32 and Romans 4. Now in Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he who transgr whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, this has to do with that time after the Lord returns. Notice Psalm 85. Psalm 85. Notice in verse 1. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land, and hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. There isn't any doubt about it. Israel is back in their land where the verse fits. Verse 2, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, thou hast covered all their sin. By comparing spiritual things with spiritual, I know that Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, matches Psalm 85, verse 1 and 2, and I know therefore that the time then is at the second coming of Christ, it's after the captivity has been brought. It's after they come back to their land, after they're established as a nation, then the Lord saves them. Then the truth of Romans 11, the deliverer shall roll out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's God's covenant unto them when he shall take away their sin. And he said, And all Israel shall be saved as it is written. Well, the way it's written is that they that turn from transgression in Jacob. In other words, all that turn from the Antichrist under the Lord in the tribulation, all that turn back here, turn over here, they will be saved, their sins washed away, their sins covered, their sins blotted out in the day when the Lord returns. Compare with me, please, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 1. David said, Have mercy upon me, upon me O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Look in Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34, and notice in verse 20, uh, 25, Isaiah 44, 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. In other words, he brought them out and will never remember them again. Now, go to Romans chapter 4 
And notice in Romans 4, Paul quotes David. And notice what he says. In Romans 4, starting in verse 4, Now, him that to him that worketh, that is, tries to do righteous works, repentance, uh, praying through, uh, getting baptized, all and all and all and all, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of death. But to him that worketh not, doesn't do any kind of religious work at all, works not. Now I realize people don't believe that, but this is a passage that refers, don't try to do anything to appease God. Don't try to do anything to bring favor unto yourself. That's the idea. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord Im, uh, will not impute sin. All right, what I learn about that then? I learned that what is going to happen to Israel over here is true of us back here looking back to Calvary. What, I, what does that mean then? It is like there is a book. Here is that book. And that book has your sins written in it. All your sins are written down. And so I find that in Revelation chapter 20, at the great white throne judgment, the books are going to be opened. So the sins of the people are written in books. But wait a minute. When Jesus Christ died at Calvary, Jesus Christ's blood covered all those sins. The sins are covered up by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so even if your book of sins were opened at that great white throne judgment, God couldn't see your sins if you trust Christ. Why? Because His blood blots them out. They are taken away. They're done away with. And God can see them no more. So in here, through Paul's ministry, we look back to Calvary and know that our sins are blotted out, wiped out, covered over, done away with, and God cannot remember them ever again, just as Israel over here, when he comes again, he'll blot out their transgressions and will never remember them again. Atonement for the church took place at Calvary. Atonement for Israel at the second coming. You can be saved right now by trusting Christ. Will you receive Him right now? Trust Him as your Lord and Savior and be saved today. Until next time, good day.